good afternoon my friends welcome back so i think we're on legitimately the sixth batch of cards now we we saw some from the developer a spattering of different class cards but also we got the monster evolving card and some other cards to go with it so let's jump straight in because we've got quite a few to go through this time so our first card is the forest protector this is a squirtel five strength for 11 provisions play a bronze nature from your graveyard so 11 provisions is quite high however um a lot of people are just gonna there's not many bronze nature cards that you want to play but the one that you'll probably want to play is rebuke since it's five damage which is also pretty pretty damn good and you get plus two if you've got treant this guy is a treant so you can kind of make back his provisions just by playing him and it allows you to remove something hopefully for five strength so it's it's a pretty decent one um i think it's expensive and i don't know if people need that amount of removal um it's nice to have the option though but i think i'm going to give it uh three stars for now because you're very limited and i don't think it's going to lead anywhere it's just big removal option um so we're going to give it three stars for now uh, you guys can let me know if you think it's a four. Um, but for now, I'm going to give it three. The next one we've got is Eredin Blake Break Glass. So this is the start of the Wild Hunt. So Monster's all about the Wild Hunt. Okay, which is great they're coming back. And they're trying to really bring the synergy back. And I love that. So one thing we've got to say to start with is the change between Frost and Fog. So they're switching Frog and Frost around. So... Fog used to hit the highest enemy units and the fog the lowest. Whereas now it's the frost that hits the highest enemy units by two and fog that hits the lowest by two. Now this really works with dominance, which is the wild hunt uh, main core mechanic. So Eridan here is a five strength for 10. Deploy spawn a frost on the enemy row for two turns. So that's four value. Dominance increase the damage dealt by frost by one. So that would actually turn it into six damage. And since it always hits the top, uh, the highest enemy unit on that row, uh, it's easier and it works well with Dominance, which is a great change. I love it. It's taken a long time for them to actually figure that out. But uh, yeah, good. Frost now synergizes with Dominance and Frost and Wild Hunt thematically go together amazingly well. So this guy is worth nine, right? Um, but if he's got Dominance, he's worth uh, 11. So he's really quite a decent card, I think. Um, I think he just about pays for himself. However, the frost that he increases by one from dominance works on every single frost that you play. So this actually starts to become a very interesting card. Um, because if he can stay on the board, five, like I said, is doable now with a card we just saw with Rebuke and stuff like that. But if he stays on the board, you can defend him. Then all your frosts are increased, providing you've got dominance as well. Uh, so they do three damage. Now I'm really interested in how how meme you can take this, how exaggerated. Can you use Caranthia, which is a wild hunt unit, which is nice, to create a copy of Eridan, then create another copy of Eridan, then play Eridan, so that your dominance triggers and increase the damage dealt by Frost three times. So all of your Frosts are doing five damage per hit. I mean, it's probably not worth it, but it actually is quite exciting to have. And I think he's going to be a very staple card. So I am going to give him three stars because i think he's going to be very important uh for that archetype and i'm also going to give it a brand seal of approval because it's something that i'm definitely excited to play with um and extra like see how far you can take it so brand seal of approval for that next up we've got the red riders so this is a bronze wild hunt special card six provisions so it is wild hunt tagged but i don't believe there's any way to tutor this special card choose one spawn frost on an enemy row for four turns or spawn frost on both enemy rows for two turns so it's guaranteed to be eight value uh, well if you hit the if you hit them i like the fact that you get to choose um between both rows for little turns or one row for a long time uh, that's really good really good choice there and six provisions is better than the neutral biting frost which is seven provisions now this wild hunt archetype has some devotion re related things so i think the the biting frost neutral is going to be a no-go because they're really gonna i think trying to push devotion in this wild hunt dominance archetype not necessarily but i think they're doing a lot of cards which spawn frost 
um, faction specific. Like we just saw Eridan, we've got the Red Riders here, which is like a replacement for the Biting Frost. So this is a better version of that. And uh, like you can't use Triss if you go in Devotion, so it's just uh, maybe a little awkward to play. But again, if you tie it back with Eridan, all your Frosts do three damage per tick. Uh, I do like the card. I think it's a great looking card and uh, will be quite important. So let's give it... Damn, I don't know. If, <laughs> I can't give it four stars. I have no idea how good weather's going to be. Right. Um, I want. Let's just give it three stars for now. Right. But I do want to state that the thing about weather is that you can't. I can't, and neither can you. Take into account how good it's going to be, and how much people will clear it. No one's going to clear it in the current state. No one's clearing weather. As far as I'm aware, the Wild Hunt archetype is the only one with weather that's going to actually be any useful, apart from maybe a Skellige Storm um, for a Skellige. So, are people going to take clear skies? And no. So, we're kind of assuming that the weather's going to get maximum value because that's what happens. So, for now, it's three stars, but, you know, we'll see. So next up, we've got the Drummond Berserker. This is a bronze Skelliger card, five strength, five provisions. At the end of your turn, damage self and a random enemy by one. And when it's Berserk two, so when it goes down to two strength, transform into a Bear Abomination, which is a six strength card. So this work, this is worth like nine, right? This is worth nine value for five. It's pretty cool. Um, it's an engine card. It gets easier to remove over time. Maybe they will just remove it before it turns into a bear abomination. I do really like it though. I mean, what value is the damage in enemies though? I guess it's on crate related. Um, I guess it's a warrior, but it's five provisions, so you can't pull it with some of the things we saw in the previous video. Um, I like it. Uh, I don't think it's going to be massively important, so I'm going to give it three stars. But I am a fan of it. Um, so yeah, I like it. Next up, we've got Hergia Drummond. This is a gold Skelliger card. Four strength, one armor for seven provisions. It's got Veil, so it's hard to remove in, in the status sense. Zeal, Order, Melee, split three damage randomly between enemy units on the row. At the end of your turn, if the order is not used, damage a random enemy by one. So essentially, you need five damage to kill it, and damaging is pretty much the only way you are going to kill it. Uh, I don't think Purify Then Poison is going to be viable for you. So it's um, initially it's worth seven if you use it straight away. Seven for seven. I think the thing about this though is it's an engine until you want to use the ability. So it's an engine that could rack up, per, I don't know, uh, six, seven points possibly um, with possible synergies with Uncrate Greatsword and Dagger, but probably not. So it's an engine that could get about six or seven plus then the three on top. So it sounds pretty good, but I think the vulnerability of it is is high. It can't be locked. It needs to be five damage. Five damage seems to be coming through now. Um, a while ago, the five damage was tough, but now we're starting to see five damage coming out uh, quite a few ways now. So um, I think while it's pretty interesting in the engine until you don't want it, I think it's too risky, so I'm just going to give it three stars. Um, I think that putting this down would, you'd struggle to get value from it. However, I guess if you're going for the on crates and stuff, they do want to be locking and destroying your on crate, locking and destroy your on crate, you resurrect it, they lock and destroy it. Dagger, they want to lock and destroy this, they want to lock and destroy. So maybe you can just push through, like I do with the Queen's Guard deck, you know. Queen's Guard after Queen's Guard after Queen's Guard after Queen's Guard, and they can't deal with everything, so maybe. It's, it's relatively cheap for a gold that could get, you know, up to 12, 14 value. So the next one is Roderick DeWitt. This is a four strength, one armor, seven provision gold for Syndicate. Very similar to the one we just saw. It's got Veil, Zeal, Order, Melee, Spawn of Flaming Rose Footman. They're the three strength ones on this row. At the end of your turn, if Order was not used, gain one coin. So again, exactly like before, it's vulnerable but not to locks or poison and stuff like that. It needs to be damaged, uh, but it still is vulnerable. Now, there are probably ways that you can boost it and make it quite a lot more difficult to uh, to deal. Now, it is a, 
uh, fire sworn cards so there are ways to boost those uh, when they come onto the board and stuff so you can protect it by making it a six strength it's it's okay i mean coins are, are nice but I think it's uh, a bit too risky, so I'm going to give it three stars, just like the previous woman. Uh, it does have some synergies, and uh, it could be worth seven if you use the thing straight away. But again, it could be worth more. The next card is another Syndicate card. It's the Lonely Champion. Four strength, two armor for four provisions. It's a bronze. It's got immunity, which is pretty damn cool, which means you can't target it with anything. Like, you can't target it with a Purify can't target it with poison or a lock or um, you can't Geralt it because that requires a poison. The only way this can be countered is by row specific things. So like Igni, Geralt Erden, Scorch, Lacerate, stuff like that. So deploy, destroy all Fire Sworn tokens in this row, then boost South Weather some of their power. So it's a pretty interesting card. Um, it is essentially just a four for four though. Now what you gain is protection against lacerates or row damaging effects. So, for example, a very weird way is if they play like Skellige Storm that damages everything on the row by one, you can play this guy and then it only takes one damage rather than nine damage. Um, he does have a bit of armor to protect himself from lacerating things. But... Oh. And, and when he goes tall, they can't really deal with it unless they've got an Igni or an Urden or Scorch. You know, they can't use Geralt. So it's an interesting card in this sort of idea, but it, it's not very good because... Well, I mean, it's just a 4 for 4, isn't it? The only ways this can be good is if you can swarm so much that you need more board space. You plonk this guy down and then you just keep on swarming, you know. That's one possible way of keeping it pretty good. Swarm, place them down, swarm, place them down, swarm. Doubt it's going to be that powerful. Um, Fire Sworn Footman are the three strength, one armor. So although you're using this guy to protect against Lacerate and stuff, the, the Footman are already kind of protected somewhat from uh, row effects. So, you know, weather's starting to come in with a Wild Hunt we saw. That won't affect this because it only hits one unit at a time. So if you've got nine or one, it doesn't matter. Uh, he would help like prevent dominance, I'm sure. But generally speaking, um, let's say two stars, I think. Well, one star, I suppose. Let's go one star. Um, it's just a four for four. I can't see many uses for it. I hope I'm wrong. I do think it's an interesting card. But I, st I just can't see many uses for it yet. You know, it's a four strength card in essence uh, that has some extra powers like being immune and clearing your board for you. But next up, another syndicate card, a gold card. Four strength, one armor for eight provisions. Lieutenant Von Hurst. Horde five at the end of your turn. Spawn a fire sworn zealot on this row. That's the two strength one. V1 transform the Fire Sworn Zealot into a Flaming Rose Footman. I love this card. Uh, I'm going to give this card four stars. Um, it's just as vulnerable as the other ones we saw. You know, it will get buffed if you can buff Fire Sworn stuff as they come in. But, you know, if you've got a Horde of Five, it produces two strength every turn. That's pretty cool. And it's two strength in terms of Swarm. I think. I'm liking that they're pushing the Swarm archetype with the Zealots and stuff. Now, the, the character we saw previously, the Lonely Champion, like, this guy could make it so you have to use those. I'd love to be able to use the Lonely Champion that I gave one star to. I'd love to be able to need to use him. Uh, and this card is pretty cool. It reminds me of the old Gwent Beta days with the uh, Fire Elemental that spawned a one strength thing every turn. I love it. And you can spend a bit of money to protect them make them three strength and one armor if you want so i do like this card i'm gonna give it four stars again it's very vulnerable so you have to be careful maybe defend it or stuff but it will just keep churning them out and that's pretty cool i assume there's a lot of synergies with fire spawn nowadays okay so now we're on to the wild hunt monster evolving card it's oberon so oberon king and then oberon invader and then oberon conqueror so if you don't know who Oberon is, it's the king of, I think, the Onel. This is the guy that Eredin 
did something too in The Witcher 3. Okay, um, it's pretty cool. So it's a 6 strength for 11 provisions. Deploy, spawn and play a random wa bronze wild hunt unit at the start of the round while handling deck transform. Uh, this one's pretty bad. Um, you don't want to play a lot of the wild hunt units and not being able to choose is pretty bad. You don't really want to play them in round one. It goes for the same for other, other particular evolving cards. You don't really want to play them in round one, but um, there are some bronze wild hunts you definitely don't want to play. The second phase, Oberon Invader, create and play a bronze wild hunt unit. That's a bit better. You get a choice of three. Um, some of them you don't really want, some of them you do. Uh, there are some really nice options, there's some lackluster options, but you'll definitely at least get about 11 points for this guy. Uh, the same for the first one, you'll probably get about 11 for 11 or 10 for 11, depending on the card you get, a bit of luck. Uh, the difference between the first and second one is just the two extra options, so you get to choose, so you don't get something horribly bad. So that's kind of nice, but I still think it's a little underwhelming. You really want the third form, and you need devotion to get to the third form. So the third form, Oberon Conqueror, it's got Veil, Deploy, Create a Bronze Wild Hunt Unit, still exactly the same as the second one, but I really like this extra added a bit. Whenever you play a Wild Hunt Unit, boost it by one. I like that because it, he doesn't get super tall, and then they just, you know, Igni him or Erden him or Geralt him or whatever. He actually spreads his boost around to all the other units. Now you might consider that a bad thing if they just want to do like a Parasite on him and he's dead. Um, which wouldn't happen for the Usurper, and which wouldn't happen for the Fire Sworn. But, um, I like it. And it's a bit complicated at the minute, because in the trailer we saw him play a Wild Hunt Rider, and it pulled the other one out of his deck, and they both got plus one. So, while this says whenever you play a Wild Hunt, it may be whenever a Wild Hunt appears, or is summoned, or is spawned, or is played, we don't quite know yet, that's a balancing point. Um, I'd like it to be every Wild Hunt, but um, I like this one a lot. I think this one is really good and definitely very important. Now, this is why the Wild Hunt Dominance Frosty deck is Devotion, because this card is really good. Okay, and we're seeing another card in a minute which requires Devotion. So that means no Biting Frost neutral card and no Trist Telekinesis neutral card to play another Frost. So you have to rely on faction-specific Frosts. So the penultimate card is a 5 strength, 1 armoured, 5 provision bronze called the Wild Hunt Bruiser. Deploy, move an enemy unit into the other row. If the target moves into a frost, you damage it by 2. Reminds me of old beta days, so that means he could be worth 7. Now these cards in the old Gwent um, were very important. Being able to move things to other rows, especially if you're playing frost, is a very important tactic and you do need action specific ones we've got drowners they might still be applicable because you know you don't have to go full wild hunt but it just synergize with the wild hunt and it's definitely an important type of card you always need these kind of row moving cards um you can only move enemies you can't move allies which is fair enough but it does lack some sort of uh, flexibility there and the two damage is seven for five but the added extra flexibility that your frost is going to be useful so i would give this one I guess three stars. It's nothing magnificent, but they are quite important to weather decks if weather decks start to become decent. And the final card is a bronze monster card. Seven strength for four provisions, so another seven for four, which we've seen a couple of. Other ones have been a bit more playable, though, in non-devotion decks. This has Veil, which is great. Uh, it might help you get to dominance a bit early with a, with a bronze of seven like this. Deploy destroy himself devotion cancel the deploy so like i mean i saw this and i was just gobsmacked initially um i thought this is what a card that doesn't exist if you're not devotion why are you even printing that so initially you know pretty bad now let's go over the the other side of the coin if you're devotion great card might as well you know uh, like I said, if you play Oberon and he creates this and you're not Devotion, you got screwed. But I don't think you'll play Oberon without Devotion because his final form is so good and his other forms are not so good. So 
I think this is quite important to be devotion and I think you probably will be devotion. However, if we say you're not going to be devotion, how good is it? So if it's not devotion, you don't want to do the deploy and you want to summon him out of your deck. There are a couple of ways to do that. Ironically, you could play Hiriraquax, which is like a unicorn, <laughs> which is pretty cool. Like, you know, um, that's unlikely you'll do that. But the portal, that could pull two of these because they're four provisions. That means 14 points straight onto the board with Veil. Pretty damn good tempo play. But that means it's 14 points for 13 provisions because of the uh, the portal. It is too thinning though. But there are better better um, combos than that. There's some Northern Realms ones which don't have the, the massive risk like this of being complete brick cards in your hand. If you don't pull the portal and no one uses that at the minute. So the idea of using the portal is a cool one. Don't think it will be used because, well, you know, there's better options out there for other factions and it's still not used. Um, there's probably a couple of other ways that you can, you can summon this uh, without actually playing its uh, deploy. I'll give it a three stars at the minute. Um, basically for devotion. I can't see many ways that you'll actually put this in your deck because you're risking too much if it's non-devotion. Uh, it's just too much of a risk. Or may maybe not. I mean, Portal will work, but it's up to you. Um, three stars. I think it's a very good choice if you are a Devotion deck. Just a nice big play for, for four provisions. It's a uh, power creep in that respect. So, decent. And that's the end of this, this particular batch. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, went a bit quicker this time, I think. Yeah, a bit quicker for the amount of cards we did. So... Thanks for watching everyone, take care, and I'll see you next time.